Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone attending DelphiCon and this um, uh, webinar in particular, which is the webinar about a thriller experience that uh, happened to us in uh, October, October of this year. And um, while telling you this thriller experience, uh, this is what I think you will learn during this webinar, and that is to build a TMS WebCore based progressive web application client from the Delphi IDE. And this um, backed by a TMS XData REST API backend, also, of course, created with Delphi. Welcome, everyone, and let me uh, tell you where it all started it started on october the 14th as you can see from this email october the 14th at 1624 in the late afternoon as such we received an email from adanas popov um, who is the general manager of embarcadero and adanas was asking us if we could create an application a web application, an application for running a contest, a contest for um, Halloween pictures, uh, where previously this uh, contest was run on a regular basis every year um, with, with just exchanging uh, Halloween pictures by email. Uh, the idea was for this year to organize this uh, in a little bit a better way, a more professional way, via an app. And as such, um, Athena sent us this email Thursday, October 14, with these uh, few requirements for this application. And of course, asking if we could do something like that. Um, when receiving this email, um, I replied it with a couple of questions. I actually had three questions that immediately came up when seeing this email. First question was, okay, um, what database does this application have to use? Um, what backend technology, backend server do we need to use for this uh, application? And finally, maybe the most important question was, um, when does this application have to be ready? And um, an hour later or so, um, Athenas answered this email saying that, okay, um, with respect to database, take whatever you want, no ID. With respect to backend server or technology, same answer, take whatever you want, no ID. And with respect to the question, when does this have to be ready? The answer was next week, being Thursday, October 21. And on um, October 21, the application had to go live. So basically, October 14, an ID that had to be built from scratch and had to go live on October 21. Reflecting on, on this and of course realizing that there was not much time for reflection, I first of all consulted with my colleague Wagner Landgraf, who is uh, responsible for and manages the uh, TMS XData product at TMS. Um, TMS XData that is designed to create um, REST API backends what he thought about this ID, if this was realistic and feasible at all to create such an application in such a short time span. And the uh, answer was um, that maybe it was possible, um, but of course um, it would be quite a bit of pressure, first of all, and also it would require that we reorganize our regular schedule of development and, and planning, planned work, etc. Uh, so it was not trivial at all to, 
to suddenly drop all the other work and start working on this uh, challenge, this uh, Halloween contest application. And so we both decided on Thursday night to uh, sleep one night over it, um, to check a few conditions with the Atomas and uh, decide on Friday morning. On uh, Thursday night, we received a confirmation of a few things we checked with the Atenas. And on Friday morning, we finally decided to accept this uh, challenge and go for it. And so Friday morning, our thriller experience really got started. And the first thing we did um, was translating the requirements that were expressed in that initial email on October 14th to the requirements that we um, saw for this Halloween contest application. So um, from the original requirements, we um, made up a list of things to do. First of all, um, it should be possible to submit pictures via a web application and along with, this, uh, with these pictures, also send uh, or include a title and a description. It should be possible to see a list of all the pictures that were submitted by everyone using the application. There was no login requirement, so no real authentication authorization process, but um, the identification of users who submitted the pictures had to be done by using the IP address of the user. And it should be possible to vote on pictures submitted by other people. And also here, uh, the IP address was uh, used to control who could vote on what picture and to count the number of votes on pictures. And finally, the requirement was that there is an administration page accessible only to an admin and uh, allow from there to delete inappropriate pictures just in case someone abused this um, application and sent in uh, inappropriate pictures it should of course be possible to delete these pictures along the way along the development that started on friday morning a few extra requirements um, came along, as is typical in a software development process. And here is a list of um, requirements that um, we figured out along the way. First of all, was uh, the requirement that uh, it would that it should be possible to either select an existing picture from the local file system, or to use the camera or cameras connected to a device to take the picture live and then submit this uh, picture. It, um, when talking about using the device camera, next requirement came up. That is, of course, some devices have, have multiple cameras. And then it is important to allow the user to select which camera connected to the device to use for uh, taking the picture and then submitting the picture. Another requirement that came up was uh, controlling the client side uh, picture size. Um, just in case someone would pick a picture from the local file system, for example, that was huge, like eight megabytes these days for a picture is not an exception when using a high resolution camera. And of course, sending uh, these uh, pictures that have a really uh, high size uh, was not really desirable. So um, the idea was to reduce the picture size already at client side in case someone had picked an image of an, a really considerable size. And a uh, final requirement that came up was the idea to also share the pictures that someone submitted with um, for example, uh, share the link with other users via social media, via email, etc. So just to invite other people that they can participate in the voting. Putting all these uh, requirements together, um, 
resulted in an application with five forms. And here is um, going over all of the forms that we created and having a look at how this was technically achieved. First and the most important page is the, um, the main screen, the screen that you enter when you open the application, which is the screen to submit pictures. And from here, you can see in the middle of the screen that there is the possibility to choose a file, a file from the local file system. And at the same time, we allow that someone using it from a desktop operating system can drag files in this area. And um, by dragging the file, this is the file that will be submitted to the app. And of course, uh, this is for submitting images. So uh, the picture format needs to be set to um, picture uh, file format. The application, it was desirable, of course, that the application could run from a mobile device as well as from a desktop device so that uh, immediately brings in the importance of um, using a responsible design, a design that adapts to the um, screen size. And as you can see here, this um, implicates that on a mobile device, there is a hamburger menu because there is not sufficient space to put all the items uh, immediately visible in the header. So when you click on the hamburger menu icon, the items pop up. When you are running on a desktop screen, sufficiently wide screen, then all the menu items are in, uh, invisible immediately at the top of the screen. You can also see the um, application icon in the top left corner. And very important here is uh, app number four is the progressive web application uh, icon. So this is an icon that uh, shows up in your browser, in your desktop browser here, Chrome in this case, um, when your application meets all the requirements specified by um, Google, for example, um, to determine if your app is really considered or treated as a responsive, as a progressive web application. With progressive web applications, we mean that these applications meet a certain set of conditions. And one of the conditions is that it's uh, using a responsive design. Um, another condition is that this application uh, does all the needed things to run offline so that you can also uh, start the application immediately offline. Our application built here with TMS WebCore satisfies all the requirements of a progressive web application. And as such, this icon appears in the address bar. When you run this from a mobile device on Android, it will show you a pop-up that invites you to add this application to the home screen of your smartphone. That means that an icon will appear on the home screen of your um, smartphone and it, that you can start the application directly from this icon. And when you start the application from this icon, that the application runs full screen without an address bar and that you can actually no longer um, visually see the difference between a native installed application and this progressive web application. The same applies for iOS. Uh, iPhone and iPad. Only small and subtle difference is that uh, the possibility to add this application to, in, to install it on your um, smartphone or um, tablet, that this is offered when you click the um, share icon in the bottom of the screen. The second uh, screen is the screen that shows um, after a um, picture was submitted, and this is the screen you are looking at here. Um, show, so basically, it shows you um, the picture itself, the title, the description, the name of who sent it. And uh, the thing I wanted to um, draw your attention to here was the share button. So at, uh, in, the, in the rectangle, the red rectangle, you can see this share button. And when this share button is clicked, you see the share sheet. 
and the share sheet is visible on the right screen capture. The share sheet that you can see is the one that shows when you um, click this from Chrome, from the Chrome browser. When you click the share button from an Android device or an iOS uh, device, you will see the iOS specific or Android specific share sheet. And in the share sheet, you see the icons of all applications that have registered for sharing in this case, in this particular case, in sharing a link, a URL to your submission. And so as you can see, you can share this to the clipboard. Uh, when you have this um, on a, a smartphone, you will be able to share this um, with, for example, if you have in, uh, installed Twitter or Facebook, um, these kind of applications uh, all allow you to share this uh, URL with. And let's have a look then at the third uh, screen, which is the screen that shows all submissions. Uh, and you can scroll bottom to uh, from top to bottom all the uh, pictures that others have uh, submitted. And here you can see um, at position one, which is the pumpkin, and this is uh, what we have used as a like icon. So if you um, see a submission, the pumpkin is standard white. When you click it, it turns orange, meaning that you liked this particular picture and it shows you also the number of votes for this picture. The share button is also um, visible here on this list screen. And um, this is using a continuous scroll control uh, that is actually a built-in control, control that is part of the TMS WebCore framework. What is a continuous scroll list control? It is a control that loads the items and the items here are the pictures together with title, description, and name. It loads these items on need, on demand, uh, as the user is scrolling through the list. That uh, has a huge uh, benefit or advantage that it will only load the uh, visible items. So the, when you open up the screen the first time, this means that it will request from the server only the um, minimal needed amount of items and only as the user scrolls down through the list it will request additional entries from the server uh, so this this of course benefits the load on the server as the user is using these um, this control to scroll through uh, items and on the right side you can see uh, in, uh, in the header some additional options which are to sort the items um, by timestamp of submission, sort by uh, the name of who submitted it, and finally also when you click on the pumpkin to sort up or down on uh, the number of votes on these uh, pictures. And then and the final screen is the administration page, which is the page from where someone can delete um, pictures in appropriate content. And what you can see here is that this is using basic authentication. So obviously, in order to uh, delete a uh, picture, you need to enter a username and a password that is passed along with the requests to delete an image to the server. The server will validate this uh, username and password and when validated, will perform uh, deleting such a picture. The um, button from where to delete the picture is the trash can. And we have used uh, the same logic actually as uh, we have on the, uh, the page where you can view the submissions where you can vote on a submission uh, via the pumpkin image. Here, the trash can uh, will perform the delete of a picture. Um, what you can also see or noticeable here is that this specific administration page is normally not accessible uh, to uh, users. You need to specifically start this admin page from an URL, and that is by passing a request parameter and then uh, this particular 
uh, page will immediately start for the admin user. So, um, of course, um, the um, app went live on October 21. And you can see also now here, here and now this uh, application live. When you go to the URL, um, uh, HTTPS TMS software.com slash uh, So I invite you to um, visit this application right here, right now. And uh, you can even participate this evening. It will be very cool to see your submissions while you are attending this webinar here at Delphicom. Um, and let's exchange pictures. Let's uh, see how it works from a desktop device, from a mobile device, from every device actually. And uh, it will be fun to exchange our pictures. Actually, um, to make this experience fun, I will um, make a uh, picture of um, myself organizing this um, or doing this webinar. So you will actually i will make a picture of the laptop from where the webinar is uh, run and that's a proof that this here is all happening live and let me enter the information the title and then you will be able to see if you visit that link you will be able to see live from where I'm doing this session. Filling in some details. And then, of course, I can submit it. I need to select the country also. You can also see and experience uh, the validation that uh, is being done. And so this uh, picture has been submitted right now. And so I invite you to go and see this uh, particular submission where you can see the laptop in my home office from where this uh, webinar is happening. Additional nice thing uh, this evening or this uh, webinar is that the full source code, uh, both the client side and server side of this application can be retrieved via this GitHub repository. So uh, move over to this repository and download the source code of both the client and the server application. So now we are going to dive into um, the architecture of this application, both client side and server side, and see how this was created in less than five working days. This is uh, when you open the project from your Delphi IDE. This is the project that you will see in the IDE. And I have used some colors to indicate what the different pieces are here in this um, web client application. In green, you can see the form files. In uh, orange, you can see the files that make up the icon for your application, the icon that will go onto your uh, mobile device home screen when you install it. And you can see three versions of this icon here, three versions uh, that are used depending on the resolution of your um, smartphone or mobile device. In uh, pink, you can see two files, the manifest.json file and the servicework.js file. And these files are essential for making your web client application a progressive um, web application. And this is, uh, the, the, these are the files uh, that determine that your application can be installed on um, your device. This uh, contains the information for instructing your browser how to install the application on your device. A couple of uh, folders we have in light blue, which is the CSS, the IMG and the GS folder. This is um, folders that contain files for the CSS of your application, some images that were used and uh, JavaScript libraries here in particular 
we have also used the bootstrap library the bootstrap library um, that um, allows us to um, create a responsive uh, web application if we have a look for uh, the server side uh, here you can see uh, the swagger ui for the rest api backend server that was created with tms x data and here you can see via the swagger ui the rest api um, backends the um, endpoints and um, here you see um, quite simple the entries for um, adding a submission at entry doing a vote the add vote which was actually um, added during the process but finally not longer used as we replaced it with the last entry which is the toggle vote um, endpoint so add vote is not really used anymore but was used during the development process delete entry is the endpoint for the admins to um, delete some submission get entries is an uh, endpoint for retrieving uh, submissions and submit, uh, retrieving these uh, page by page with a specific number of items you can specify to request the um, get picture endpoint is the endpoint that returns just the picture from a particular uh, submission and the entries uh, endpoint with entry id you can add is the endpoint that returns all information for one specific uh, submission that was done by the id of this submission which is the entry id now let's go back to um, the source code of the web client application and let's begin with the startup of this web client application um, here you can see the source code for the project dpr file and so this is the code that gets executed as the application is started you can see that it is quite similar to a vcl application with the exception here that we are using the um, url query parameters to determine what exact form will be uh, launched when the application starts so you can see that if um, the query parameter results is used we immediately uh, launch the form from where um, the submission list is shown when uh, the url has the query parameter admin this starts the admin form and the admin form is the form from where um, entries can be deleted when the query um, url query parameter includes the id that means that it shows the form with just one particular entry the entry that matches the id that is passed on to this uh, url request parameter and finally when no um, query parameters are specified on the url it uh, launches the standard submission form which is the t form uh, submit um, let's maybe first have a look at our uh, delphi ide and i will open up this project from my ide so here you can see uh, in the project manager the files uh, that we talked about uh, and let's maybe first launch this uh, application to have a look at um, what exactly is being produced when we uh, launch this application so i will navigate now to the form where the application code is located so here is uh, the folder where all files making up the project are located here you can already see the application that was uh, launched from the ide i will uh, close it for now and we will have a look at the folder where all the files were uh, created for launching this application so as you can see here this is the 
result of compiling here today during this uh, live webinar. And so you can see that the main JavaScript file, the JavaScript file that makes up the entire uh, client application is, is here and it is approximately half a megabyte. And here is the HTML file from where your application is launched. And other files are the HTML file for each form in this uh, application. You also see here that we are including the bootstrap files and these bootstrap uh, CSS and JavaScript file is used for creating the responsive design. Okay, let's have a look now at our first form, which is the submit picture form. I'm opening the form now from uh, the IDE. Okay, and here you can see the form. The first thing that we notice when opening this form is that this totally does not resemble uh, how the application looks at runtime when I run it. So let's run it again from the IDE. And here it is. So here you actually see the form that corresponds to um, what we have here in the IDE. Why is it uh, so different? It is so different because we are using an HTML template here for this uh, form and where the controls on the form are actually only used for um, making up the UI control logic and all the design layout is done via HTML. When we inspect the HTML file that is associated with this form, here we can do this from the IDE, here you can see the entire HTML that makes up the form design. Now, the question is, when we have a control like, for example, this web edit control, which is called name edit, and this is the edit control that will capture the name of someone submitting a picture. How does this relate to, um, when we inspect here in the browser, how does this connect or relate to uh, this name entry field in the form itself in the application that is done via the element ID. And let's have a look at the property. Here you can see the element ID property of the edit control that is set to name input element. You can see here a whole list of all possible uh, IDs. And these are the IDs that are found in this HTML file, name input element. When I look this up into the HTML file, here you can see that there is an HTML input element. And this element um, has some bootstrap style and it has this um, ID, which is the name input element. And it is via this ID that it is uniquely connected to the web edit control on this form. And that means that in this form, in this web UI control logic, we can just refer to um, our name edit control, use its text property, its on change event, etc., cetera, and um, just deal with it this way. And it will all be reflected on the real HTML element in our HTML template. Let's have a look at one um, critical um, ID, uh, which is um, a critical thing is to submit um, an entry, to submit the picture and um, the, the title description that goes along with it. And this is done via uh, doing an HTTP request to the um, Xdata backend server. And performing this um, HTTP request is done via an HTTP request um, component. And you can actually see this uh, component here on the form. When we have a look at all the, um, well, actually it is uh, created from submitting 
and we are clicking the form submit button here you can see where is it for submit okay here you can see that we actually create the http request component and we will perform an http post command to submit an entry here we set the command for this http request to post and here we specify that what we will submit is a json object we specify the url the endpoint url which will be the add entry endpoint and here we um, create generate the json that will be submitted and when this is done the actual um, http request is happening here request.perform is what performs the http request and some interesting thing here is the await command in a web browser in a web client applications um, all the http requests these are executed in an asynchronous way that means that executing this request will not block any code at all will not block your ui it will keep the ui responsive while it is performing this request so this is an essential behavior inside a web browser that http requests are performed asynchronous that means that when we execute this request we will not immediately have the response back um, and that makes it somewhat complicated um, as we do not have the response immediately back to write our code still in a sequential way to deal with the response itself and uh, that's why in the web browser world um, this um, concept of promises and await was invented and here we actually wait for this asynchronous response of the execution of this http request and the result of this uh, response will be an, an xml http request uh, class and this is captured via this um, a response um, object so nothing in this code will be blocking but still um, the code is kept here and, and will not move to this line of code until the http request has been performed when it has been performed we get this result into the response variable local variable and there we can perform a simple check if this request was successful or not if it was successful the response will be http code 200 and um, when we receive the response what we basically do is parse the json that is returned from the server this is the response we get from the server it is parsed as json text and what we do is extract the value from it and the value will be the id of the new entry that was created that was submitted when we have this um, new entry what we do is create a new form in our web client application and that form will show the entry that was submitted let's maybe have a look at um, the json object that was created to perform this uh, request and this is uh, where you can see it here we uh, get um, the the name from the user from the uh, web edit control uh, that is used for that we get it also for the description uh, input control um, where you enter the company the email address uh, the description you can see here the country combo box and so all this is put together into a json object and what we also add of course is um, the image the image here when we want to send it via an http request to the backend the image will be converted into a base 64 encoded string and we need to submit text anyway to um, the backend 
So that's why this binary picture data is converted to a base64 string. And here you can see uh, the code that detects if the size of this picture as a base64 string is larger than one megabyte or not. If it's larger than one megabyte, what we do is actually resize uh, this uh, picture, convert it again to a base64 string, and then it is fine to include it here in the JSON object. This is where it happens um, and submit it. This uh, functionality to uh, resize the image is actually built in into the web image control. So if we inspect the form designers, here you can see the web image control. This is where your picture you take from the local file system or that you take with the camera, where it will be shown. And this um, control has this built-in feature to um, resize your image. So um, this was the preview and the resizing. And let's have a look now at the um, page in the application that will show all the submissions. And maybe we can first have a look at uh, the Delphi form created for that, which is the uh, overview form. Here it is. Here you can see the same concept. Um, it does not resemble at all um, how it looks like in uh, the browser. Let's maybe uh, take the browser here and do a view submissions. And here we can see actually what you have already submitted during this session, which is actually very cool uh, to see. I see that uh, David I is even uh, live here at Delphicon, which is fantastic. So we can see all these uh, entries live. This is the form uh, that we can see here in the Delphi IDE. And we can see here buttons that are also mapped onto HTML elements. So the same story goes here for this uh, submission form with, where this is the HTML that makes up uh, the form. And these buttons are mapped onto HTML elements all via the element ID property. And as you can see, this, this is the sort up and down button, the about button, etc. But the core, the core part of this uh, form is the web continuous uh, scroll control. And this is a control part of TMS Web Core that has been specifically designed for this kind of purpose where you dynamically load content as you scroll through um, the list. And essential here in this uh, control are two events, which is the uh, on fetch next page. And let's have a look at the implementation of the on fetch next page um, event handler. This event is triggered whenever the continuous scroll control needs extra data for displaying. So as the user either in an in initial view or as the user scrolls through the list, um, as you scroll, it will trigger this event asking, please give me uh, the next URL I should um, request the uh, next items from. Uh, and it will pass along the parameters what the page number and the page size. So the amount of items requested and the, the page number of uh, the new page of items it will want for this list. Uh, when we look at the implementation of the get entries URL, which is a function that basically just returns the URL to the endpoint of the Xdata backend, um, you can see here that it calls the get entries API endpoint and passes along as uh, request parameters the sort order, and then, of course, the page number and the page size, how many items per page. So the continuous scroll list control does all this by itself as it needs items. It just uh, asks the application for the next uh, URL, and it will then perform the HTTP request to this uh, URL. 
and fetch the items returned is expected to be returned as a JSON array. It will fetch these uh, items and it will construct items for the continuous scroll control for each uh, item or JSON object in this uh, JSON array. And this is the code that is executed when every item or each JSON object in the JSON array is created. But first of all, let's have a look at what the continuous scroll control will do automatically based on an HTML template that is specified for the control. So here you can see um, the um, property web continuous scroll uh, item template. And you can see the HTML that is specified for this template. That means that this template will be applied to every item created. And you can see here this percent ID percent, or also this percent votes percent, uh, percent message number, percent language, etc., percent description percent. So what the continuous scroll control does is use this HTML and merge this with the information it extracts from the JSON object in the JSON array that the server will return. And when there is a value with, um, with um, the value name, language, or description, it will replace the value um, within this HTML template. And this is actually what is responsible um, for already um, creating, um, as you can see here in the browser, for creating an entry like this, um, including the picture, where um, the, the, the title is, where um, the name of someone and description of someone who submitted is. And what is happening in addition to that, uh, that is it will create an image control on the fly for this element. And the sole reason for creating this image control here is for um, associating a click handler with that image. This here is actually the um, um, image for the pumpkin. It connects to and it just handles um, the event handler for the click with the like click method. When you double click the picture, it will also perform a, a vote or unvote. And that means that we are just creating another web image control mapping or binding it to the picture of the item and handling the on double click also um, via this like click event handler. And here you can see that um, for this image here that was created, we are on the fly changing um, the URL for this picture. We change it to pumpkin.svg or pumpkinsmile.svg, which is either the, the white icon, unvoted icon, or here the orange icon uh, when someone has uh, voted. And finally, we also create an, uh, a button control, a button control that we link to the share image that is um, in this uh, item. And from there, we can uh, also deal with sharing it uh, by handling uh, it via, via the share click event handler. Let's first have a look at the like click event handler. And this will call the uh, set like with the ID of the submission. And that means also executing an HTTP request for um, the toggle vote endpoint that you can see here. So it performs um, an HTTP request, a post to this uh, endpoint, and from there um, the vote will be toggled. When the response is successful, the status code is 200, then we um, get from the response the new state when whether this uh, submission is voted or not voted. And depending on this new state, we will replace the image for the pumpkin with the orange version or the white version. And what we will also do is here fetch the uh, HTML item that shows us the number of votes. And we will 
add into this uh, HTML element, we will add the number of uh, new the new number of votes that were returned from this um, request. So that is how the continuous scroll control works and how we handle uh, clicking on it. And uh, as we are going closer to the end of this webinar, let's have a quick look at the uh, server side, the backend, the uh, HTTP REST API server. And this is an XData-based Windows uh, server. Note that XData can also generate for you from the same code a Linux um, server, but here in this case, we have used a uh, Windows-based XData server that is deployed on an Amazon EC2 server. And here you can see uh, the server, the, the files on the server, and you can see that we have used a SQLite database for this um, app. When we have a look at the database uh, model or scheme, it's quite simple. We have one table for all the entries, entries of uh, submission with the basic information that goes along with each uh, entry and an additional table that counts uh, votes on a specific um, submission. So here we capture the um, ID of um, what is uh, someone what someone has voted for and the IP address from where it was um, voted. And that's actually the only information we keep in the database. Xdata works together with TMS Aurelius, which is our object relational mapping um, product. And that means that we can deal with um, object Pascal objects, um, instead of directly dealing with the underlying database. And here you can see the mapping of um, the entries table in the SQLite database, the mapping to an object Pascal class that uh, represents an uh, entry. And you can see here the timestamp of creation, for example, the ID, the name, company, etc. The XData server, as you have seen in the Swagger UI, exposes a number of endpoints, and these endpoints actually correspond to our uh, service that is central in the XData server. And so this is the definition of this um, service. And you can see public functions, add entry, get entry, get entry, get picture, add vote, toggle vote, delete entry, as you can see, the names that have been used here in the service class in the XData server are actually the same names that the uh, endpoints are using that you can call from um, the web client application. So when you add new methods here in your uh, XData service, this will automatically become endpoints in your XData server. And uh, let's have a look at one implementation, one actual implementation of such an endpoint, which is the toggle vote uh, endpoint. Here you can see the code uh, for that. Um, the toggle vote, it has an one request parameter, which is the um, submission ID, entry ID. And what we do here is actually perform a lookup. You can see that this is using uh, Aurelius, because we deal with objects and we use uh, something like uh, the TDB vote is the class that represent records in the votes uh, table. And so you can see that we are performing here in code and uh, look up to see if um, for this particular ID, uh, the IP address is already there or not. If it's there, what is happening if is that the uh, entry is removed because it means it was already voted for. So the toggle vote will unvote uh, that item. If um, this uh, vote record for this particular IP address was not found, that means let add some uh, record for this uh, specific IP address. 
uh, and um, set the um, entry point. Let's point the entry uh, to this uh, vote and then add this uh, vote to the votes table. And with that, we come to um, the conclusion of this um, webinar, uh, where we have uh, had a, where we had a look at um, both the client implementation and the server implementation of this um, Halloween application. And I am having a look right now. If I can oh, I'm see. here, uh, Bruno, okay. and I can read some of the questions off here. Um, okay. Does this work in XE8 as well? Uh, yes. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it does, it's, and it work it in uh, 11? To uh, Delphi 11. I'm sorry, how far back does it go? XE7. Okay, great. Other questions? Um, for the HTML that's used, is that um, generated automatically? Does somebody have to write that? How does that work? And what about someone making their own custom components? Uh, the HTML that we created was um, custom created. So um, what you can see here, for example, in this uh, submit form, uh, we fully created it ourselves. So a web core offers you a choice whether you use the design as is on your form, or if you if the HTML will determine your layout, and um, then you can specify everything here as you can see in HTML. You can see that this is heavily uh, bootstrap based HTML. It uses these uh, specific bootstrap classes. Uh, like the collapsed navbar, etc. These are, when you are familiar with Bootstrap, you will uh, notice right away uh, the classes uh, that are used here for making up this particular layout. So it will depend on your preference. Do you prefer building everything directly from the form designer? Or maybe you will hand off the job to someone who's uh, familiar with Bootstrap and HTML and graphics design, et cetera. And then you can integrate what maybe someone else or yourself have been has been uh, creating. Okay, so it, 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 it okay. The, is the, can, what server platforms can you run on? Can you run on Linux server? Where else can you run? Uh, Windows and Linux are the, um, the targets that uh, xdata supports i uh, technically you can also run it from a mac but i believe that most servers are not uh, mac based now i know that some of your stuff works on uh, arm linux does this also work on arm linux yes oh great um yes 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 uh via delphi 11 of course That makes me happy. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, it so is the del is the code where can people download the code in your slides? Uh, if you navigate to GitHub, I can bring up that slide again where the hit GitHub uh, link is shown here. So you can navigate to GitHub right now. And uh, all the source code is uh, in this uh, GitHub repository. Can you put there's a chat window there on the in the control panel? Can you paste those links in the chat window? Okay, let me grab this uh, link. That's all. It gets so hard to do, especially on mobile devices. It drives me bonkers. But okay, I copied it and now let's see where this chat window is. It's at the bottom of the control panel there. It's always so small, <laughs> but I managed. Here it is. You see it? Yep, I will. So I can put it out to the, it's sent just to me, but I'll send it to everybody. Okay. 
Excellent. Uh, it would be interesting to see what part is running on a web server and what part is running in the browser. Uh, well, uh, as you, it are actually two different projects. There's the project for the client, the web core client, and this is the project that you uh, see here in um, my Delphi IDE, okay? And there is also a project that you can find in the GitHub repository, a project that is for the XData uh, server. So um, you compile the XData server and you put this XE on, well, you can run it locally or you put it on some server. And from there, the endpoint is accessible. And then you have the web client application. And uh, this is um, yeah, running directly from the browser and performing the HTTP request to the XData server from where it fetches uh, the data. Of course, when you start the application and you only see the submission screen where you take the picture, um, no connection with the server has already been made. It's just the application running and ready to capture. It's only when you first submit a picture of move or move to the screen where you see the previously submitted pictures that requests to the X data server will be performed to either submit or get these specific uh, entries. Does the X data server part, uh, someone's asking for clarification, does the X data server actually run on ARM Linux or is it only the web part that runs on ARM Linux? I was confused with uh, ARM. Um, ARM is on the Mac, uh, but uh because it is compiled from the Delphi IDE, so it supports the targets that um, the Delphi compiler supports. Okay. Um, does TMS WebCore work in 10.0 CE, P edition? In 10.4 Community Edition, it works, yes. Fantastic. Um, does the, let's see, does one request equal one thread? Sorry, I'm running two at the same time here. Is each request got its own thread? Um, you mean from the XData server? Uh, yeah, I guess so. That's a good question. Um, I need to check that with my colleague uh, Wagner. So I suggest to, um, yeah, you can send us, us an email uh, to be 100% sure and check that off with my colleague Wagner, who uh, is responsible okay. for the X data server. Uh, what components does somebody need if they're like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I need. Um, how do I, where do they, how do they get started? Here we have used nothing more than uh, web core for the front end for the web client application. So this is 100% web core and no other components were used for the web client application. For the server, we have used XData, so also no other products. So this is Delphi 11 plus web core for the web client and XData for the server part. So with these three things, we created everything shown here during this uh, webinar. Three things, Delphi, XData, WebCore, is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. I was just trying to type it and I was like, make sure I didn't get something. Um, there is the, um, can you do a SAPI with XData, build in a SAPI component that you can load into IIS or Apache module? Um, uh, 
let me look that up. Yes. Let me look that up. Ah, okay. No, no. So it's um, Xdata on Windows is using HTTP Sys. Uh, so this is running in an also on, under IIS, but in a different way from um, what technically an ISAP uh, interface is. Is actually HTTP Sys is actually a higher performance. Uh, implementation uh, for running under IIS than an ISAP DLL is. Okay. Uh, how many requests per minute can the REST server handle? Um, I think there is no universal answer to this uh, question because it will heavily depend on what your request is actually doing on the server. I give yeah. the example of voting. Uh, here you can see, okay, it performs a lookup in the votes table and then it will toggle a vote at add an entry or not. But for example, the HTTP endpoint that will return one specific picture will send back a lot more data than a toggle vote endpoint. So um, I think there is no universal answer on uh, the number of requests. It highly depends on what your request is performing server side and what amount of data is uh, involved. Uh, I think one additional thing to note, which applies to any REST uh, technology is that it is stateless and this means that it, it is very easy when you are entering um, or, you, or your load is becoming an issue um, as the backend the server is stateless you can easily duplicate this on multiple servers and, and have multiple servers handle uh, the load. Scaling is actually very easy with um, REST, stateless REST endpoints. Uh, Larry's saying that the TMS software site, the making of Radoween, is giving an error message right now. Um, and there's a question if you can use OAuth 2. Let's me, um, let me have a look. Uh, If I can see that there is actually a message. Uh, with I meanwhile, I will uh, answer your question about um, OAuth two. Um, at this moment, uh, you can use it, but at this moment, you will need to develop this um, yourself, add this functionality uh, yourself. Um, we have XAuth coming up. It's actually in beta. If you are um, a customer, you can already access uh, that uh, beta. And um, with XAuth, this um, implements for you automatically an OAuth to authentication authorization uh, workflow. So XAuth is coming to um, address that automatically for you. While XAuth is not yet released, um, you can. Um, you will need to add this uh, manually to um, your application. I see, yeah, I see. I checked right now, but I see from here that the application is live. If you want to add uh, an event code, for example, on on exit to an edit component. How do you do that? Do you need to use JavaScript here? How is this compared to no. .NET Web Forms? No uh, JavaScript required. So suppose we have here our submit form. Uh, 
and I have here a uh, web edit that is used for editing the name of the submission. I have here the on exit event and I can uh, just add, I, I could do some validation like for example, if uh, name, name edit dot text equals empty, so no uh, name was specified, I do something like uh, please set a name. So this is the on exit event handler for the HTML input element that uh, corresponds to um, the name edit um, that is linked to the name edit control and I can do all the um, coding for all the events for this particular control uh, directly in object Pascal language. Fantastic. I love it. Uh, TMS WebCore, is that only available in all access or can you get it through other subscriptions? It's uh, separately available, so. Uh, is it in TMS business subscription or is that a, or separate? It's not part, so it's actually uh, available in two ways. Can you see um, the screen here? It's available in two ways. Here it's uh, available as a standalone uh, product. You can download it from here. There's a trial version um, and it's also part of all access. Uh, and also noteworthy, I think, is that there is an academic version for uh, students um, here from our academic uh, page. You will also find uh, TMS WebCore. So academic Fantastic. is there, there is the separate version WebCore standalone, or it's also part of all access. Uh, where did I put the questions? I lost the question window. <laughs> oh, there it is. It was behind the other window. Uh, what version of Bootstrap do you use? Um, here in uh, this Radoween app, we have used Bootstrap 5, and we have a slight preference towards Bootstrap 5, as this is a small uh, payload, contrary to Bootstrap 4, that also requires the jQuery payload. Bootstrap, Bootstrap 5 does not require jQuery, and that's why we have a preference to use uh, that one. And it's the one that is used in uh, this Radoween app. You can actually see here that the, this is the payload for Bootstrap. These two files, um, I think you can see them right now here on my screen. Yes. This is um, the JavaScript and the CSS uh, that was used. Um. <sighs> Sorry, I lost the question I was going to ask you next. Oh, if someone was making a new project, if they wanted to make start out from scratch, making a new web core project, how would they do that from the IDE? Oh, that's very simple. So you go to File, New, Other. And here you have TMS Web, where you have the different types of applications, web applications that you can create from TMS Web Core. In this particular case for the Radoween app, we have chosen the TMS web progressive web application type as this. I will generate one right now and I will not save any change. So now it has created for us an empty um, one form progressive web application. And so here, from here, you can now start adding your components um, and start uh, developing your application. So when I add an edit the button, the classic example, let's add one more control. And so the classic thing, weblistbox.items.add, edit one dot text. So everything is object Pascal, of course, and we are already up and running with this um, progressive web application. So here 
we have it and it's up and running that's that's all you need to do to get started and you have a progressive web application uh, immediately uh, from the Delphi IDE. All right, great. Well, um, I need to go ahead and go with where I got the other session running. So thank you for this. If they want more information, if they go to TMS, what your website, TMS software, you have a number of the videos up on there as well on your YouTube channel. People can learn more about TMS WebCore. I'm a huge fan. So thank you for putting this together. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for um, your time and thanks for having me. And um, I wish you a great further uh, conference, Delphicon, um, with, uh, with many interesting things to learn for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.